Hi there, welcome to That Expert Show, where you help run the show. I'm Anna Canzano. Thanks so much for joining me. Such an important conversation that we're having in this episode about the mental health of kids. I think that we can all agree that kids have been impacted very heavily in this pandemic. Their normal system of going to school and the normal things that they expect out of life and playing sports and their normal activities, like even just going to the park, have all been disrupted disrupted um, during COVID-19. I've talked to a lot of parents who are struggling with older kids that seem to have just kind of lost their motivation when it comes to academics and the activities that they enjoy. So this is an important conversation and I do want to thank Trillium Family Services for sponsoring this episode. Trillium Family Services, their mission is building brighter futures with children and families. Just a fantastic resource for you if you are looking for mental health support for your children in this time. Our guest today is the Vice President of Community Programs for Trillium Family Services in the Portland metro area. She is a licensed professional counselor and she has more than 20 years of experience in both child and adolescent mental health um, care. So let's bring in Lana Shotwell. Lana, thanks so much for being on that expert show. Thank you. Lana, I wanted to start off with you um, because you're really on the front lines of kids who are in crisis. What kind of challenges are you seeing them face right now that are different because of the pandemic than you know what they might have already been facing before? Right. I think um, it can really, really vary. And every kid is unique and every kid is different. Um, so we have seen kids um, with increased anxiety. We've seen kids with increased behavior issues and difficulties um, keeping control of their anger. Um, depression has really uh, manifested itself in all sorts of ways with children from just losing those social connections and um, not being able to be with their friends every day. And, we also have seen um, a lot of family conflict arise just because people have been at home so much. It's really been uh, across the board. And, and so these kids and the challenges that they're facing that you're speaking of, um, you know, are there real life ramifications that are uh, happening? Are grades slipping? Um, are they really just kind of lacking motivation in all areas of life and things that used to bring them joy just don't anymore? Right. I do think um, it has been, especially as we're getting near the end of the school year, and it's been for most students an entire school year of doing um, online learning, uh, motivation to keep going has been really tough. I know... Um, Schools have done the best that they can, and they really sort of set the expectations much differently than they ever have before. Um, and it's really, they want kids to show up and they want kids to be present. And they're doing their little bits and pieces here and there to help kids with their emotional and behavioral health. Um, so I think school motivation has been huge, especially for um, if you were a senior and this was your last year of school, you're missing out on so much. Um, and then I think for the little kids, uh, imagine being a kindergartner and this is your first experience at school and your teacher's on a screen and your mom and dad were great parents. They didn't let you in your screens very long or for very long chunks of time. Um, so it is, it's been uh, unprecedented on so many fronts. Um, yeah. And I think that most kids are really resilient and many of them are not loving this and enjoying it, but some of them are able to see the light at the end of the table or the tunnel. And a lot of them have uh, really supportive families, but we, we know that there's a lot out there too that are really kind of slipped through the cracks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I can just relate with the experiences we've had at home. There have been tears on distance learning days. There have been tears and they weren't all shed by the kids, <laughs> you know. Um, it hasn't been easy and I can't imagine, 
you know, families where um, both parents are working or it's a single parent family. I mean, there's all kinds of struggles that are underway and still very present right now. Um, I can imagine that for the folks at Trillium, you guys have had to pivot and really think of therapy in a much different way. What have you discovered in this last year? We discovered that um, we were able to make a transition from meeting with our kids and our families um, in person, uh, face to face, um, was a, how we operated normally. And then we had to make a transition really, really quickly to telehealth. Um, and I have to give all of our therapists huge kudos because they all did it and they were very creative and they came up with interventions and ways to engage kids and engage families that I personally would have never thought of. Um, but we also know that there's some kids that just really need that interaction, that face-to-face -face interaction. And so as it was lots and lots of people we are really excited when we get to go back to kind of being in schools and doing our jobs as we usually do um telehealth has worked great for a lot of families um i feel like one of the silver linings is is that um the parents are right there um it's so helpful for us to be able to make an impact on a child if we have their parents engaged and their parents are helping us out um so that has been one silver lining is that the kids at home and the parents are likely at home also. So we've been able to connect with them and engage them um, in ways that perhaps when they were just going to drop their kid off at the office um, and then ask, you know, us to do our thing uh, as a therapist. Um, this is been, that's been the one silver lining. Yeah, I, do, I, oh, I, go ahead. I can imagine that, um, you know, you have more successful outcomes when parents are more engaged in the process um, to a degree, especially for, for the older kids. Yeah, and the, and the younger kids too. I think um, when you get to be an adolescent and you're kind of doing that thing that adolescents do, which is to find their identity and maybe question things around them and why they're the way they are, you know, working, your brain's kind of developed enough to be able to work through some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for our little six, seven, eight-year-olds, um, having mom know to stay calm and this is a really good way to let your kid know that you're listening, but that really is an expectation that bedtime is at eight o'clock. Um, we, we, we love to help. <laughs> that's, that's great work to do with us younger kids. Yeah. And you're right. Actually, having a parent engaged is probably even more helpful when the the patient is younger, or the client is younger. Um, how difficult was that, though, to get, you know, kids and parents to buy in and be consistent about meeting with a therapist if, you know, so much of the child's learning is also on a screen? Did you you know, find reluctance um, to be on yet another screen for a different reason? I think that we probably uh, are having shorter amounts of time on the screen for our sessions. Um, we uh, probably did have a lot of family that said, I am, we're taking a break. And then when it's not all about the screen anymore. We'll call you back if we still need your help. So I do think, unfortunately, it was another like, ugh, more screen time. Um, yeah, it, yeah, that is the one um, downside. I will say for adolescents, they're so used. I mean, the screens are what they do now. Right. <laughs> so to have them um, have to switch to telehealth, that's secondhand to them at this point in time. Right. right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what would you suggest to folks? Because I think a lot of folks at this point, we've been at this for more than a year now. Um, I think pandemic fatigue is real. Mm -hmm. I think that we're all weary from uh, the strains that, you know, this has put upon our families, our lives, our regular routines. Um, what is your advice for parents um, let's start with the parents of younger kids um, in terms of helping keeping those younger kids mentally healthy. Right. Um, I think keeping routines 
Um, I'm a parent myself and I know that suddenly we didn't have to get up so early in the morning and I, I found bedtime <laughs> with teen and slipping farther and farther out. Um, so I think keeping routines, um, waking up every day at the same time, a good breakfast, you have to brush your teeth still. Um, you know, there's school and then after school, let's really get away from the screens and um, you can play safely outside with your friends and the weather is getting nice. So we really need to get our kids outside and exercising and active and playing again. Um, so I think for the little kids, that's huge, just good structure, good routine. I think um, getting them in to see the doctor, if it's been over a year, just for that, uh, that well check up visit with their pediatrician would be really helpful. Um, I think, like I said, get them out there and get them playing um, outside in the fresh air um, would be huge right now. Yeah, I would agree. In fact, you know, I will admit there have been a lot of days with distance learning that I've said, I've told the teacher like, hey, we're just not coming back after lunch because it's too nice out. And I think my kids mm -hmm. like toast for the day mentally. I think she needs to get mm -hmm. outside. That's I feel like that's more important to her right now because personally as a mom, my biggest concern was that over this last year that our kids would not love learning anymore. <laughs> like that right. was my main goal was I just didn't want them to hate the idea of learning in school um, because of the experience they had. Right. And I do think too, uh, parents need to let go of academic pressures right now. I mean, we want kids to show up and we want kids to turn in their work. But um, for some of them right now, let them do the bare minimum and be okay with that. Because this hasn't been a fun year. <laughs> and honestly, all kids are going to be in the same boat. You know, it will be when they finally get to go back to school. And hopefully that's in the fall. But who knows? Um, hopefully, everyone's will be in the same boat, right? So everyone's kind of had the same experience this year. And so we kind of just got to let go of that really high academic pressure that some parents might want to put on their kids. I completely agree. I, I can't, I couldn't agree enough because mm -hmm. I even realized like on a personal level, I was like struggling to, you know, to make sure that our first grader was getting all of her assignments turned in on time and all this. And right. I was like, wait, is this really about her? Or is this about me? you know, trying to like check all the boxes. And I eventually just changed the boxes because I was like, I have different right. boxes that we need to check. I need to make sure that our kid um, is just mentally healthy and happy and uh, not gonna just burn out from this whole process. Right. Um, does that advice change at all for, you know, the tween and teen years in terms of maintaining a routine and getting outside. And it, and it seems so basic, but um, are, are okay. there additional strategies? No, I mean, I, that's good for adults too, right? Right. <laughs> so I don't think that that advice really changes even for those middle-aged tween or middle schoolers. Yeah, I really don't. I think it's good advice for everybody. You know, something that um, I, I've noticed um, just from my own experiences with kids and whatnot is that, especially here toward the end of the year, a lot of the kids that are logging in to do school from home, they're just keeping their cameras off the whole time. Like the whole class will have their camera mm -hmm. off. So they're really just logging in because they have to show that they're present in some way but they're not turning their, their camera on to really engage in a meaningful way. What's your take on that with your background? Um, I've noticed that with my own kids' classes too. Um, and I think the schools were really asked to not put a bunch of pressure on kids to turn their cameras on. I think part of it is who knows what's in the background and every kid has a different background, right? literally and figuratively in it, that could be reflected in what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so I think that teachers really haven't put the pressure on kids just to know that it's it's okay if your house looks a lot different than this other kid's house. Um, I it's, it's tricky because I 
I think that that was another sort of layer of them maybe perhaps even feeling more isolated um, and more um, distant in this, so in all of our distancing this past year. Um, but I can understand it at the same time. And I, I, I'm glad the teachers kind of decided that it, they weren't, that wasn't something that they were gonna force kids to do, just to allow them that ability to kind of choose what they wanted to present to people. Yeah, that's been um, that's been a struggle, I think, for a lot of kids. Now, moving forward, you know, we're in May now, and we're heading off toward the summer here pretty soon. What do you see uh, on the horizon for kids, for Trillium, and how it will continue to serve kids and families? Right. Uh, really, it it kind of just depends on the school that we're in and which one we're working with, but a lot of schools are back and they're really happy to have us back in the building. Um, and they, everybody's really nervous about what school will look like in the fall. Um, what are kids gonna bring back? You know, is there gonna be a lot of trauma from this past year or are they just gonna be so excited that it doesn't matter? Or have they completely lost all their ability to sit still in a classroom for, you know, an hour at a time. So there's a lot, a lot of um, concern and worry with what uh, what will be presented in the fall. And I will say to, uh, schools are doing a really good job of um, kind of letting their teachers know what to look for. They're reaching out to us. We've had um, lots and lots of schools say, we, we might need your help in the fall, which is great. Um, it's it's gonna be like an ending, but at the same time, another kind of beginning of returning back to school as normal if we get to. Um, I think just, like I said, get those kids back on a routine. Um, know that they might be worried. They haven't seen their teachers in person. They haven't been around a bunch of kids. Um, they might still be worried about what happens if I get COVID. Um, so even with, and I think that this hybrid situation that's going on right now where they're going back just a little bit of time is hopefully for the kids that are, are back, a nice little baby step um, to kind of get used to that situation again. Um, it's so hard to know right yeah. now what is happening in the fall um, and when things will be normal again, if, if they were really are hmm. so what you know what would you want parents to know in terms of like what would you want parents to know in terms of the signs to look for in their children um, that help you realize that you know my kid really needs some help like really needs to talk to somebody in a professional level um, you know when it comes to their mental health right I think some big signs would be is if you ever have your son or your daughter um, say statements that really make you concerned that they might hurt themselves, that is an immediate go get help. Um, if you have kids that are going to refuse to go back to school, I think that's another reason to go get help right away. Um, I think all kids are going to have moments, they're going to have their tantrums, they're going to be angry. Um, but I think how long is how long does that last and how long does that go on? Um, that is sort of a, a clue. So if we all have our moments and we can talk about it and we can recover and we learn from it, um, that's normal and that's what a healthy families do. But if you're kind of in that cycle over and over and over again and things just don't seem to be getting better, um, that would be a good time to reach out. That is um, great advice. Uh, you know, I think a lot of parents struggle in getting their kids to open up to them. You know, right. kids beyond a certain age, they just become like little mystery boxes. And no matter how you try to unravel them, it's like you can never quite get to the core of what's going on with them. I think a lot of us are pained by that. Um, what do you do in a situation like that where you feel like you just can't quite get through to a kid to even figure out how they're feeling, let alone to, you know, help them resolve it somehow? I think there, well, I have one little helpful hint that I 
know from being a therapist for adolescents. And I uh, used to work in a program where we really were out in the community and we would even do work at homes. And if you can get an adolescent into a car, sometimes they just talk. They're not looking at you. They don't have to look at you. So that I take a drive. <laughs> it was amazing how kids would open, an adolescent would open up. Um, I think for the younger ones and, and the adolescents too, is that you need to put in that quality time with them. And you don't need to, you can't have any expectations, but it's tucking your kid into bed and reading a story if they're young, routinely, every night. I think for the adolescents, it's shooting hoops in the backyard or at the park. Um, but you need to do that consistently. Um, and then your kids will open up more. That's kind of when we teach parenting classes for the younger kids. It's you got to you got to build a really good foundation with your kids in order to get them to keep developing in the way that you want them to be. So yeah. even for the older ones, you got to spend that quality time with them. I've heard that with, you know, with kids, uh, regardless of age, it's like they have two buckets that you need to fill their mm -hmm. power bucket and their attention bucket. And especially for the littler kids that it may only take 10 minutes a day of really focused attention mm -hmm. to fill each of those buckets. So the power bucket being, let them decide what to do for 10 minutes, just totally like child directed. And attention bucket is similar, but maybe a little bit different where you're just, like you're saying, spend some quality time with them and really help yeah. them feel, you know, f filled up with some goodness. Yeah. And I think that for adolescents too, it, it, it doesn't really, it changes a little bit, but they still, even though they, they aren't going to admit it necessarily, they still want that time. Yeah. Um, can you help me understand um, how Trillium operates within the schools? You mentioned earlier that, you know, the schools that are back in session in person, we're really excited to have you back. Um, what does that mean and what does that look like when Trillium is operating on a school campus? Right. Um, it really varies school district to school district, but we have um, in the metro region over 50 therapists or about 50 therapists um, in schools and a lot of the schools in Multnomah County and in Clackamas County. Um, and the school is our partner and they give us the space and they recognize how important mental health is. And if a kid doesn't have a foundation of mental health, he's not going to learn anyway. So they, they are able to invite us in, they give us a space, we bring families in, we connect, we do our therapy at the school site where the kid is. Convenient for the family, they don't have to drive across town to a clinic. Um, and we've been operating, sort of doing school-based mental health for over 20 years now. Um, and it's a, it's a great model, I think, because school is such a huge part of a child's life. And, and so we're just connecting all those dots. Um, we also have a lot of programming. So we'll do support groups. We'll do teacher training. We'll, um, we kind of have an, a wider range of services and aren't just therapy um, that we partner with a lot of school districts too. Wow, that's fantastic. I wasn't aware that that's how you operated. So in the schools where you actually have a space to conduct therapy, are you there in place of a school counselor? Because that's the framework that I'm used to, that I grew up in. No, we aren't. We really see the school counselor as the person that helps us kind of identify this student needs more help than I can give them. Or that, like they might know that something traumatic happened to that kid and they pull us in to kind of support that kid. So we're separate, but we work really closely together and we're we're kind of the ones that when those school counselors identify a need beyond just what's going on, then they, they reach out to us and wow. refer the child to us. That is an incredible resource for them to have. Um, any last thoughts before we go here about, you know, um, advice for parents and kids if they're listening, um, uh, how to go into this summer, the way to have a successful summer? I think to... Like I said, get outside and play, um, get off the screens. I know it's so hard and you guys are so used to letting your kid and you're probably still working and you don't have a place for them to go in the summer. And I, that's my life too. And I get it. 
Um, but just try your best to really kind of keep the screen time to a minimum, get them outside to play. Um, maybe reach out to those old friends, knowing that they can be outside safely, keeping their distance, um, and start making those connections again, um, because the kids probably are ready. Yeah, that's certainly good advice. You know, the kids I feel for are ones that maybe they're new to their school and they didn't have a lot of time to make connections with kids um, before this all happened. Right. Or maybe they're just at an age, like you said, in kindergarten where they're just kind of getting to know other kids. So I think particularly in those circumstances, it is incumbent upon you know, the grownups in their life to try and make the connections for them as much as possible these days. It's just harder. You know, you don't normally see kids running out and just going into the neighborhood and figuring out who the neighborhood kids are. Although in my ideal world, that is what <laughs> things look like. Right. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's a lot of it's on the parents right now. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lana, thank you so much for your advice and for weighing in. I, I hope that um, a lot of people watch this episode and benefit from it. Thank you. It was fun to talk. And thank you for joining me for this episode of That Expert Show. We will be creating a tip sheet based on the advice that Lana shared, and we'll be posting that on our website, uh, thatexpertshow.com. We'll also put this very show back out to you as a YouTube video and also as a podcast. So wherever it is that you listen to podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or SoundCloud or some other platform, you can search for That Expert Show as well. Um, and hey, connect with me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I would love to hear from you and get your ideas for experts that I should interview and topics that we should tackle. It's really a two-way conversation. That's the best part of this show. It is That Expert Show, and it's where you help run the show.